Hello and welcome to the Columbia Daily Tribune's Behind the Stripes webcast. This is Tribune Sports Editor Joe Wall Jasper along with Tribune Football Beat Writer Dave Matter. Dave, Missouri gets the record back to 500 mark with a 52-17 to victory over Iowa State. And I guess maybe the, the big telling thing from that game that everyone noticed was that at long last, after much uh, bemoaning from fans and media, they got the ball to Henry Josie and voila, they scored 52 points and everything worked out. Fixed. It's amazing how that works. Mm -hmm. um, well, it, it was on Saturday. Uh, we'll, we'll see if they continue to, to go with that uh, with that game plan. It, it, I would think you try it until it doesn't work. Missouri ran the ball 58 times on Saturday, which is their most since uh, the first year of Brad Smith's uh, era running the offense. So it, it seemed to work pretty well. Iowa State didn't have any way of stopping it. Now, they're not a great defense. Um, but Missouri didn't get too cute in trying to throw too many passes. Uh, they gave Josie, I think, 20 touches if you mm -hmm. add up everything, which is what they put as the as sort of the maximum for him. And he was really effective once again. Uh, they even got Kendall Lawrence involved. I think he had 16 carries. So it's easy to get more carries and more touches when you're getting first downs, but it's easy to get first downs when you're giving the ball to your best player. So mm -hmm. it's amazing how that works hand in hand like that. I think the other thing is when you're running the ball a little bit more on first down, you're not in all these third and longs. Half the reason they're not any good at converting third downs is they're in a lot of third and longs. So that was helpful. Um, putting him back there on kickoff returns was sort of wise and maybe overdue, um, but that worked out well for him. And I think a lot of times fans or media kind of oversimplify how to fix things. I don't think necessarily this is one of those times. I think yeah. it is really just as simple as your best player needs to touch the ball a lot, and he is... Now, again, Iowa State's not a very good team, but Missouri is not facing world-beater defenses from here right. on out. The Big 12 has not got really world-beater defenses, but if they do, they've already faced the two of them that are probably the, were the best in Oklahoma and K-State, right. and they ran the ball pretty well on them. Yeah. So I think looking forward, I mean, I think there's no reason to think he can't be a guy who can get you 100 yards a game, and the running game maybe can be uh, kind of the thing you lean on, which would lead, leads into question number two, which is James Franklin. Um, pretty good game overall, although in the second quarter there he had a kind of a series of plays. He he threw a – even the touchdown pass to Agnew, it was really forced into a tight window. It was a good pass and it worked out. But then he forced a few other ones and kind of threatened to get Iowa State back in the game. Do you think he's at a stage of his development where he can go into a big game with him and, and he can win it? He's gotten him close a couple times, but can he, he win it? I think he's getting there. You know, if you look at his numbers, um, they're, they're pretty good for what probably a lot of people expected for him, just his, his accuracy, his efficiency. And then you just watch what he does. Like that pass to Agnew, I mean, that was a, that was a pretty impressive pass mm -hmm. and, and the kind where um, that, that you'd see Blaine Gabbert make on occasion when he was really in the zone like in that bowl game last year. And that, that's what that kind of reminded me of. So he can do it. He's shown that he has the potential. He just has to, uh, you know, eliminate those those really curious decisions and those bad throws like he had there on back-to-back on -back plays. But I'll say this for, for Franklin. After that second interception, he completed his next 10 passes, I think. So mm -hmm. he, he seems to sh shake them off, um, you know, pretty quickly and, and move on. Um, you know, and but you're not going to have any margin for error against a, a team like Oklahoma State, like Baylor, like A&M, where they're just going to score a lot of points anyway. You can't afford to to turn the ball over in those games. So that's I think going to be the real test if if he can be, um, you know, more consistent, lead, leading more drives against these teams that that you know are going to be in position to score every time they touch the ball. Yeah, because Oklahoma State gets up a lot of yards, but they are good on turnovers, and that's yeah. kind of how they beat you. They end up having more possessions than you based on their taking the ball away a few times. So. That's a big big deal against them. I think it may be another reason you'll lean on the run a little bit more. Yeah, and, and one you know side uh, result of the running game working out, and I was talking to some of Missouri's receivers yesterday, they say they're getting open easier than ever uh, mm -hmm. because defenders are so uh, aware now of the running game and they're watching things in the backfield because you not only have to, they don't only have to worry about Josie, they've got to worry about Franklin running too. So that kind of becomes the defender's priority, and, and guys like T.J. Moe and Michael Egner are getting more open now than they were a year ago when Missouri really struggled to get open downfield, and, and that led to a lot of incomplete passes, a lot of stalled drives, a lot of third down, um, you know, incomplete passes again when, when Gabbert was a pretty good quarterback, but things just weren't working out because they had no threat of the run. So now I think that's that could make life a lot easier for Frank on the passer, the fact that, that uh, defenses have to you know respect him and really have to respect Josie more than anything. Yeah, when they got in a rut last year in the middle of the season, I think a lot of time they were facing that kind of that 
com combo man coverage where the teams are just locking up on those inside receivers. I think teams would probably be a little more leery to do that with a quarterback who can run. You don't want your back turned to him that much. So right. it all probably works hand in hand yeah. in that way. Um, Missouri, as much as when they went to Kansas State, we thought maybe it's a good matchup for their defense because it's such a running team. This might be the opposite because they've struggled against the pass. You're facing probably the best passing game in the nation with Whedon and Blackman and all those guys. What do you think uh, we see here? I mean, do you think you think Missouri can can match up at all? In that it's going to it's going to be tough. I mean, just from what we've seen from Missouri secondary so far this year, when they've been tested vertically, they haven't been very good. I mean, they got beat bad at Arizona State on some long plays. Same thing at Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State might be better than those teams as far as just stretching the field. You know, Landry Jones and Brandon, Brandon Weed in the quarterbacks, Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, you're kind of splitting hairs saying who's the better one. Even with the receivers, Ryan Broyles is a different kind of receiver at Oklahoma than Justin Blackman at Oklahoma State, but they're both really tough matchups. And, and Oklahoma State, more than anybody, throws deep and stretches the field, and, and that's where Missouri's kind of struggled in their pass coverage. So. It, uh, those guys, they're going to get beat. It's going to happen. Uh, it's just a matter of how many times. And if they can make a play on the ball in the air, which Texas uh, defensive backs, a very young secondary, did a few times. And, and Whedon didn't have a great game at, at, uh, at Texas last week, even though Oklahoma State won. They got their running game going. But maybe Missouri saw some things that Texas was able to do. They did a lot of man coverage stuff on the outside. But that's pretty dangerous when you've got a secondary that struggled this year and you've got great receivers outside of just black and they've got some other weapons too and they've struggled for stretches in these games like against a&m they were terrible in the first half and a&m kind of blew it there in the second half so it's not inconceivable that missouri would would yeah. play right with these guys and beat them it's only i think the vegas odds makers have a seven point game so it's not like it's a the impossible dream here but i just think the mat the strengths match up against the weaknesses fairly well yeah for Oklahoma State. And, and missouri hasn't gotten a great pass rush against good teams yet this year and Oklahoma State might have the best line in the Big 12, one of the best in the country. And they just have some big, huge guys up front that are going to make life tough for, for Brad Madison and Chuck Wee Smith and those guys that, that try to get a rush on the quarterback. So we'll, we'll see. They need a little uh, disruption in the middle. Maybe this would be a nice coming out party for Sheldon Richardson, unless you count last week as a coming out party. But they can certainly use a little push up the middle because he gets rid of the ball so quickly. Yeah. Um, that's one way to disrupt him is to get in his face up the middle. Absolutely. Lastly, uh, hopefully we're not talking about this too much longer, but realignment again, uh, the developments this week, uh, curators meeting, which is scheduled for a while, but anyway, it's set up uh, for the end of this week in Kansas City, which, you know, if, if Missouri is following the path of Texas A&M, you would think this might be the point where they announce their plan to withdraw from the Big 12, but we're not so sure it's going to happen. I mean, from talking to people around Mizzou, they're not, they don't know what Brady Deaton's thinking. He has kind of gone into the cone of silence. And I know there's been some reports in the New York Times, certainly that this move is imminent, but I don't think those are coming from Columbia. So I think there is still a certain amount of question of what is going to be decided in Kansas City. This seems to be much more cut and dried outside of our little sphere here in Columbia, where I think we're sensing more uncertainty and just not really knowing what's going to happen in these meetings. I mean, we're pretty certain that something's going to happen. I think either they make the decision to withdraw from the Big 12 and keep on following A&M's path to the SEC, but... There's, we're really not given any real indication that that decision has already been made and that that's a given. So, you know, Thursday and Friday's meetings are obviously huge. Um, and, and I think at this point we can say we're seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel as far as Missouri's decision because they're getting to the point now where they have to decide, do you leave the Big 12 or do you stay and, and you try to work things out and, and the conference can move on with TCU with, if, if they're going to add two more schools to go to 12. We're closer to that, but... I, like you said, I don't think we're sensing the same things that are that are being uh, reported outside around the country, maybe down in Texas also. I think maybe from the outside looking in, you could look at all these steps as like, well, they announced they were giving Brady Deaton the power to look at other conferences. Um, he's not participated in some of these votes um, as far as adding TCU, which you know are certainly signs they might be leaving, signs right. that I would see. I, I don't know why he would behave that way if he weren't leaving. But you gotta, you never quite know what's going on in Brady Deaton's head. He's not talked publicly at, at all, except for that brief bit at the press conference. And the people around Mizzou that we've talked to don't seem like they don't. They act like they don't know one way or the other. Which, like you said, it kind of does fly in the face of the prevailing wisdom that it's right. just a done deal. 
Well, hopefully <laughs> no soon, but uh, I mean, there's such uncertainty going on, but it seems like there's such certainty outside of Missouri, where I think they're just, like you said, they're just kind of following the template that A&M set, and not as, just assuming, but kind of assuming that that's the direction Missouri's headed, whereas people that are sort of in the know on this one aren't quite as certain, so... I think the, the, you know, and, and on the one hand, you can say, well, they're just, you know, they're just going through the procedure, and maybe they'll go. The, the danger in that is, I think you have now gotten your fans to where they assume this is a done deal. You know, I think most of them are excited about the SEC, right? And so, if you lead them along this path, and and they're all just assuming it's going to happen, and then whoops, at the end, we change our mind. I think that's going to be real ugly. And, and, and in that, you know, yeah, it's just PR, but it's not just PR. It could be money. I mean, there's going to be people who, if, if Missouri stays in the Big 12, are probably going to want to not donate money, et cetera, et cetera. So it could get a little ugly yeah. depending on what happens, I think, in, in Kansas City. Just staying doesn't necessarily equal the status quo for Missouri. I mean, there could be some major stakes involved financially and, and just the image of, of uh, how all of this has unfolded. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. All right, well, join us next week when perhaps we will have some sort of conclusion to that. And we will also look forward to talking about the Oklahoma State game and looking forward to next week's game.